Good day, everyone. I will be your lecturer for community and public health lecture. So we're going to discuss this finals, the different diseases, and environmental health. So let's start with overview of non-communicable diseases and related risk factors. Learning outcome. At the end of this chapter, you, the student, should be able to Describe the burden of disease of the four main non-communicable diseases or NCDs. Describe how risk factors affect the burden of NCDs. And adopt healthy lifestyle practices. So this will be the outline of our lesson for today. First, we're going to discuss the definition and characteristics of NCDs. Then global trends in NCDs. Definition of risk factors and metabolic risk factors common risk factors for NCDs, and in-depth discussion on four leading NCDs, four behavioral or lifestyle risk factors, and four metabolic risk factors, including its definition, global burden, and health effects. What is non-communicable disease? Non-communicable disease, or NCD, this is a chronic condition that do not result from an acute infectious process and hence are not communicable. From the word itself, non-communicable, it means it doesn't spread on an area or certain location. It is also a disease that has prolonged course and that does not resolve spontaneously and for which a complete cure is rarely achieved. So this is in contrast with our communicable diseases or the infectious diseases, which are readily treated through antibiotics for bacterial infections and it is completely cured. What are the characteristics of NCDs? First, it has a complex etiology or causes. That's why we need to consider multiple risk factors for each NCD. It has a long latency period, meaning it has a long waiting time for the disease to emerge. Uh, this is common in elderly people or older age people where um, it's the time that they have this kind of ailments or diseases. It is non-contagious in origin, meaning it doesn't spread in a certain area or location. It has a prolonged course of illness. Say, for example, uh, when a person has diabetes or cardiovascular diseases, it is not completely cured and the disease stays throughout his or her lifetime. And lastly, it has functional impairment or disability. Uh, let's take again diabetes for an example. So for diabetes, especially for type 1, so the islets of Langerhans or the beta cells or islets in the pancreas is not working or is damaged. We have types of NCDs. First is the cardiovascular diseases, such as the coronary heart disease, stroke, etc. Cancer, we have a lot of types of cancers, such as prostate cancer, liver cancer, cervical cancer, breast cancer. Chronic respiratory diseases, such as asthma, bronchitis. Then diabetes, we have types 1 and 2. Then, chronic neurologic disorders such as Alzheimer's, dementia, arthritis, or musculoskeletal diseases, and unintentional injuries, say for example from traffic crashes, accidents, etc. This is a study made by the World Health Organization in 2004, projecting the deaths in 2015 and 2030. So as you can see in this graph, the most predominant cause is the cardiovascular disease. Next is the other NCDs. How do we define risk factor? Risk factor is an aspect of personal behavior or lifestyle, an environmental exposure, or a hereditary characteristic that is associated with an increase in the occurrence of a particular disease injury, or other health condition. What is a modifiable risk factor? This is a behavioral risk factor that can be reduced or controlled by intervention, 
thereby reducing the probability of disease. The World Health Organization has prioritized the following four. First is the physical inactivity, so meaning there is little to no exposure to physical activities, tobacco or cigarette use, alcohol use, and unhealthy diets such as intake of increased fat and sodium with low fruit and vegetable intake. In contrast, a non-modifiable risk factor is a risk factor that cannot be reduced or controlled by intervention. For example, age, gender, race, and family history or genetics. So this is again from the World Health Organization for the non-communicable diseases and its risk factors. So as you can see in the chart, the cardiovascular, diabetes, and cancer share the four modifiable risk factors such as the tobacco use, unhealthy diets, physical inactivity, and harmful use of alcohol, while chronic respiratory only has tobacco use as a risk factor. Next is the metabolic risk factors. So the word metabolic refers to the biochemical processes that is involved in the body's normal functioning. So behaviors, which is a modifiable risk factor, can lead to metabolic or physiologic changes. The World Health Organization has prioritized the following four metabolic risk factors. These are the raised blood pressure, the raised total cholesterol, so both are linked to cardiovascular diseases. Elevated glucose is linked to diabetes mellitus. And overweight and obesity is linked to both cardiovascular diseases and diabetes mellitus. Let us now proceed to the four leading non-communicable diseases. So these are the cardiovascular diseases chronic respiratory disease, diabetes, and cancer. Let's start with the first NCD, which is the cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is a group of disorder of the heart and blood vessels and may include coronary heart disease, which is a disease of the blood vessels supplying the heart muscle. Next, cerebrovascular disease or stroke. So cerebro means or this refers to cerebrum and cerebellum. So this is a disease of the blood vessels supplying the brain. Next, peripheral arterial disease. This is a disease of the blood vessels supplying the arms and legs. And finally is the congenital heart disease, which refers to the malformations of heart structure existing at birth. So this is the progression of the cardiovascular disease. So when we eat something fatty, so the fat or the cholesterol particles or otherwise called as the lipoproteins will be circulated through the blood. Then further increase of intake will have the cholesterol deposited in the lining of the artery until buildup begins. Further buildup will result to plaques that will be formed or this is called as the atherosclerosis, this will block the normal blood circulation. This will result to increased blood pressure, increased total cholesterol, and increased LDL. Global burden of cardiovascular disease. So these CVDs are the number one cause of death globally. An estimated of 17.3 million people died from CVDs in 2008. This is 30% of all global deaths. 7.3 million were due to coronary heart disease, while 6.2 million were due to stroke. Over 80% of CVD deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries. By 2030, almost 25 million people will die from CVDs. These are the risk factors for cardiovascular disease. We do have major modifiable risk factors. This include high blood pressure, abnormal blood lipids, tobacco use, physical inactivity, obesity, unhealthy diet, 
which includes excessive intake of salt and diabetes. Other modifiable risk factors include low socioeconomic status such as low income and no employment, mental ill health such as depression, psychosocial stress, heavy alcohol use, use of certain medication, and lipoprotein. Next is non-modifiable risk factors such as age, heredity or family history or genetics, gender and ethnicity or race. And novel risk factors or the new risk factors will include excess homocysteine in blood. Homocysteine is an amino acid which is, which is produced when there is a breakdown of protein. So this means that there is an excessive intake of protein. Next, inflammatory markers such as a C-reactive protein. This is produced in the body whenever there is an inflammation which is due to bacterial infection. Next, or lastly, is the abnormal blood coagulation or clotting such as elevated blood levels of fibrinogen. Let us now proceed to the second non-communicable disease, which is the diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus, this is a disorder of metabolism, the way the body uses digested food for growth and energy. So we have four types. Type 1, which is a juvenile onset, where there is little to no insulin produced by the pancreas because of the destruction of the beta cells in the islet of Langerhans. So this insulin, this is a hormone that lowers the blood glucose levels by converting glucose to glycogen, which is a stored energy. Type 2 diabetes, this is adult onset. So what happens here is that the cells cannot take up glucose as food or energy. So this results to increased blood glucose levels. Next is the gestational diabetes. So this is a diabetes um, that is occurred during pregnancy and a pre-diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance. So the type 2 is caused by modifiable risk factors and is the most common worldwide. So, greater than 90% of all adult diabetes cases are type 2. Burden of diabetes. 347 million people worldwide have diabetes. In 2004, an estimated 3.4 million people died from consequences of high blood sugar. More than 80% of diabetes deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries. WHO projects that diabetes deaths will increase by two-thirds between 2008 and 2030. Healthy diet, regular physical activity, maintaining a normal body weight, and avoiding tobacco use can prevent or delay the onset of type 2 diabetes. These are the risk factors for diabetes mellitus. So for major modifiable risk factors, this include unhealthy diets, physical inactivity, obesity or overweight, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. Other modifiable risk factors include low socioeconomic status, heavy alcohol use, psychological stress, high consumption of sugar sweetened beverages, and low consumption of fiber. Non-modifiable risk factors include increased age, family history or genetics, race, and distribution of fat. Other risk factors include low birth weight and presence of autoantibodies directed against pancreas. Now let's move to the third non-communicable disease which is cancer. So cancer is a generic term for a large group of diseases that can affect any part of the body. This is also a rapid creation of abnormal cells that grow beyond their usual boundaries and which can then invade adjoining parts of the body and spread to the other. 
we do have two types of tumors, the benign and malignant. For benign tumors, this is an abnormal growth of cells, but it does not proliferate or metastasize or spread to other parts of the body. While malignant tumors, these are harmful tumors that has an excessive rate of growth. It metastasize, proliferate, or spread to the other parts of the body and can create its own blood vessels to supply nutrients for its abnormal growth. Global burden of cancer. 7.6 billion people died from cancer in 2008. 70% of all cancer deaths occur in low and middle income countries. Deaths from cancer are estimated to reach 13.1 million by 2030. And about 30% of cancers are attributable to behavior risk factors which are modifiable. For cancer epidemiology, as shown in the graph here, breast cancer has the highest incidence and somewhat high in mortality rate among the other cancers. Now let's discuss cervical cancer. So this is a cancer of the female reproductive system. We do have two types of cell present, the squamous cells. So this forms the lining of the organ and the glandular cells which is responsible to secrete substances. So this tend to occur where the two types of cells meet in 99% of cases linked to genital infection with human papilloma virus or HPV. So it is important that females will have to do vaccination or immunization against HPV to avoid cervical cancer. This is the world epidemiology for cervical cancer. As shown in the graph, Eastern Africa has the highest incidence and mortality rate for cervical cancer. Risk factors for having cervical cancer include human papilloma virus infection, smoking, immune deficiencies due to certain conditions like AIDS, poverty, no access to pap screening or papanicolaou staining or smearing, so this is a procedure done by the doctor where the doctor will get a swab sample from the female reproductive system smeared onto the slide. It is transported to the laboratory for processing, fixation or fixing, then staining. Then it is read by a pathologist, which is a physician in the laboratory, to check the characteristics of cells that are present in that or in that person. And lastly is the family history of cervical cancer or genetics, which is a non-modifiable risk factor. Now let's move to the lung cancer. So this is a cancer that forms in tissues of the lung, usually in the cells lining air passages. This is the leading cause of death globally, recording 1.37 million deaths in 2008. This affects more men than women because it is known that men are heavy smokers. We do have two main types, the small cell lung cancer and a non-small cell lung cancer. Epidemiology, so the graph here shows that females in Northern America has the highest incidence and mortality rate. For males, it is in Central and Eastern Europe. Risk factors for having lung cancer. So first is smoking cigarettes, pipes, or cigars now or in the past or whether the person has stopped in a certain period of time next being exposed to second and smoke being treated with radiation therapy to the breast or chest being exposed to chemicals like asbestos radon chromium nickel arsenic soot or tar and persons living where there is a heavy air pollution now let's move to breast cancer. So this is a type of cancer that forms in the tissues of the breast, usually in the ducts or in the lobules. This occurs commonly in women, rarely occurs in men. One out of eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her lifetime. Epidemiology for breast cancer, as shown in the graph here, Western Europe has the highest incidence for having breast cancer, both male and female. 
Risk factors for breast cancer include hormone therapies, weight and physical activity, race, genetics, or family history where people or person has this kind of genes like the breast cancer antigen 1 and breast cancer antigen 2. And age is the most reliable risk factor where risk increases with age. Next is the prostate cancer. This is the second most common cancer among men. The cancer develops inside the prostate gland and the risk factors are age, race, obesity, and weight gain. So as seen in the graph here, um, Australia has the highest incidence from 1975 to 2005. In order for the doctors to diagnose prostate cancer, a series of tests will be um, performed like acid phosphatase for chemistry and prostate specific antigen or the PSA in the immunology serology section of the laboratory. Epidemiology, as you can see in this graph, Australia or New Zealand has the highest incidence, then Caribbean has the highest mortality rate for prostate cancer. And finally is the colorectal cancer. This is the third most common type of cancer. This forms in the lower part of the digestive system, specifically in the large intestine. The risk factors include age, race, unhealthy diet, and low exercise, diabetes, and family history of colorectal cancer or genetics. Epidemiology, the graph shows that Australia or New Zealand has the highest incidence rate of colorectal cancer for both male and female. The last non-communicable disease that we will discuss is the chronic respiratory disease. Global burden, this is a leading cause of death. It has high underdiagnosed rates and 90% of deaths occur in low-income countries where its places has a high density of air pollution. The shared risk factors for all chronic respiratory diseases are cigarette smoking, occupational dust and chemicals, environmental tobacco smoke or the secondhand smoking, and indoor and outdoor air pollution. So these are the modifiable risk factors. For the non-modifiable risk factors, these are the genes, infections, socioeconomic status, and aging populations. An example of the chronic respiratory disease is the COPD. COPD stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So the term COPD is used for lung diseases that prevent proper lung airflow. This is due to the obstruction, which is the result of inflammation or swelling. It is also called as chronic bronchitis, emphysema, and this is more than just smoker's cough. Burden of COPD Accurate epidemiologic data on COPD prevalence, morbidity, and mortality are difficult and expensive to collect because it requires a lot of resources and manpower to have a wide coverage and to reach those in far-flung areas. 65 million people worldwide have moderate to severe COPD. More than 3 million people died of COPD in 2005, and this comprises 3% of all deaths globally. And almost 90% of COPD deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries. Another example of chronic respiratory disease is asthma. As you can see in the picture here, this is an illustration of a normal bronchial and an asthmatic bronchial. For the asthmatic bronchial, you can see there is inflammation, redness, and swelling in the bronchioles, and there's also a deposit of phlegm. So medications can help control asthma. Now let's discuss risk factors. Why do we need to determine risk factors? Surveillance for non-communicable disease can be difficult because of the lag time or the long latency time between exposure and a health condition more than one exposure for a health condition and an exposure linked to more than one health condition. So interventions and actions that target risk factors are needed and is important to prevent disease. 
So this is the pattern of the risk factor surveillance. So upon interventions, education, promotion, and awareness, it changes people's behavior, thus reducing risk. And the end point will be the reduced burden of the disease. This graph shows the deaths attributed to 19 leading risk factors by country income level, which is made in 2004. So as you can see in this graph, the leading cause of that is high blood pressure, which is true to all income classes, the high, middle, and low, and it is followed by the tobacco use. Let's discuss tobacco use. Tobacco, cigarette, or pipe kills up to half of its users. Tobacco kills nearly 6 million people each year. An annual death toll could rise to more than 8 million by 2030. Nearly 80% of the world's 1 billion smokers live in low and middle income countries. This graph shows that tobacco use is a risk factor for 6 of the 8 leading causes of death in the world. So this include the ischemic heart diseases, cerebrovascular diseases, lower respiratory infection, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, tuberculosis, and trachea, bronchus, and lung cancer. Among smokers, the health effects of tobacco use are cancer, coronary heart disease, diseases of the lungs, peripheral vascular disease, stroke, and fetal complications, and stillbirth. For secondhand smokers, this causes heart disease, including heart attack and lung cancer. The next risk factor is diet. For global changes in diet, most countries have increased overall daily consumption of daily calories, fat and meats, and energy-dense and nutrient-poor foods such as starches, which is found in bread, rice, pasta, refined sugars in sugary beverages, drinks, pastries, cakes, and trans fats, which is found in fried foods. The health effects of having an unhealthy diet are coronary heart disease, stroke, cancer, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, diseases of the liver and gallbladder, and obesity. The next risk factor is the physical inactivity. Global changes. So 31% of the world's population does not get enough physical activity. Many social and economic changes contribute to this trend such as aging populations, transportation, and communication technology, especially that we are now in a pandemic situation. So we are currently using our devices, gadgets, and our internet connections to work at home, study at home, and be entertained at home. So according to the study of Lee et al, 6 to 10% of major non-communicable diseases worldwide is attributable to physical inactivity. 6% of this for coronary heart disease, 7% for type 2 diabetes, 10% for breast cancer, 10% for colon cancer, and 9% for premature mortality. The health effects of having physical activity reduces high blood pressure, adverse lipid profile, arthritis pain, and psychiatric issues. And this reduces the risk of having type 2 diabetes, certain cancers, heart attacks, stroke, falls, and early death. So uh, while we are staying at home right now, um, please do not forget to have just minimal physical activity so that it can reduce these types of diseases. The next risk factor is the harmful use of alcohol. So global alcohol consumption, 11.5% of all global drinkers are episodic heavy users. 2.5 million people die from alcohol consumption per year. The majority of adults consume at low risk levels. Estimated worldwide consumption of alcohol has remained relatively stable. So on the chart below, as you can see, those countries colored in violet or purple, those are countries having people with heavy alcohol consumption, while those in green, so it has 
people with minimal alcohol consumption. Harmful use of alcohol for excessive drinking per day for heavy drinkers on average. Males consume greater than two glasses of alcoholic beverage per day. For females, it's greater than one glass for binge drinking during single occasion. Males consume for about greater than or equal to five glasses, while females consume greater than or equal to four glasses. The immediate effects of alcohol are diminished brain function, loss of body heat, fetal damage, risk for unintentional injuries, risk for violence, coma, and death. For long-term effects, these are liver diseases, cancers, hypertension, gastrointestinal disorders, neurological issues, and psychiatric issues. Now let's move to the metabolic risk factors. So what are the four metabolic risk factors? These are raised blood pressure or hypertension, raised cholesterol, raised blood glucose or sugar, and overweight and obesity. Now let's talk about the raised blood pressure. So this is otherwise known as hypertension. So how will you know if you have hypertension? So you'll have to take a blood pressure test. So this is done through the use of your sphygmo manometer and your stethoscope. So this is measured by systolic over diastolic in the unit of millimeters of mercury. So the systolic is the amount of force your arteries use when the heart pumps. So this is the first beat when you, when you release the dial in your sphygmo manometer. The diastolic is the amount of force your arteries use when the heart relaxes. So this is the last beat that you will be hearing in your stethoscope. So for the reference ranges, for systolic, normal is less than 120. For diastolic is less than 80. For pre-hypertensive, systolic is 120 to 139. Diastolic is 80 to 89. For hypertensive, systolic is 140 plus and diastolic is 90 plus. This illustration shows the prevalence of raised blood pressure ages 25 plus. Age standardized both sexes during 2008. So countries labeled or colored in red has high prevalence of raised blood pressure while those on um, the lighter color are those who have low prevalence of raised blood pressure. Health effects of raised blood pressure. This is a leading risk factor for stroke, a major risk factor for coronary heart disease. In some age groups, the risk of cardiovascular diseases doubles for each increment of 20 over 10 millimeter of mercury of blood pressure. So other complications of raised blood pressure include heart failure, peripheral vascular disease, renal impairment, retinal hemorrhage, and visual impairment. Hypertension and excessive sodium intake. Sodium through hypertension is a major cause of cardiovascular disease, deaths, and disability. About 10% of cardiovascular disease is caused by excess sodium intake. 8.5 million deaths could be prevented over 10 years if sodium intake were reduced by 15%. So how does sodium or salt being associated with hypertension? So excessive intake of salt or sodium without the intake of water makes your body's water level go down or be diluted and thus this makes a person's blood pressure levels to be elevated. So we do have the sources of sodium, so most of the people are unaware of how much dietary sodium they are eating. In the U.S., 75% of sodium consumed comes from processed and restaurant foods. In China and Japan, 75% of sodium consumed comes from cooking with high sodium products. So here are the recommendations and actual intakes of sodium by the World Health Organization and the Pan-American Health Organization. So for the recommendations, 
a population salt intake of less than 5 grams or approximately 2,000 milligrams of sodium per person per day is recommended to reach national targets or in their absence. This level was recommended for the prevention of cardiovascular diseases. For the actual intake, the latest global estimates show that average sodium intake varies from 2,000 to 7,200 milligrams of sodium per person per day. The next metabolic factor is the raised total cholesterol. So there is a test in the laboratory called as lipid profile. So the tests within the lipid profile are the total cholesterol, the HDL or the high density lipoproteins. These are the good cholesterol. So a normal person should have high levels of HDL. Then LDL, which is called as the low density lipoproteins. These are the bad cholesterol. So a normal person should have low levels of LDL. The LDL is very low density lipoproteins, has the highest amount of triglycerides. And the triglycerides together with the fatty acid or fatty acids, these are the monomer of the fat, which is a macromolecule in the body. So this is stored in the fat cells. Global burden of raised total cholesterol. In 2008, global prevalence of raised total cholesterol among adults, which is greater than or equal to 5 millimoles per liter, was 39%. 37% of these are for males and 40% for females. It is estimated to cause 2.6 million deaths. Health effects of raised total cholesterol. So this increases risks of heart disease and stroke. Globally, one-third of ischemic heart disease is attributable to high cholesterol. A 10% reduction in serum cholesterol in men aged 40 has been reported to result in a 50% reduction in heart disease within 5 years. A 10% reduction in serum cholesterol in men aged 70 years can result in an average 20% reduction in heart disease occurrence in the next 5 years. The next metabolic risk factor is the elevated glucose. So glucose or sugar produces fuel and energy for our cells. The hormone insulin helps control the amount of glucose in our bodies by converting glucose into glycogen which is a storage compound in our liver. So for the global burden in 2004, it was estimated that elevated glucose resulted in 3.4 million deaths which is 5.8% of all deaths. Globally, approximately 9% of adults aged 25 and over had elevated blood glucose in 2008. Health effects of elevated glucose. Elevated glucose levels can lead to type 2 diabetes. Diabetes is a leading cause of renal failure. Lower limb amputations are at least 10 times more common in people with diabetes than in non-diabetic people. Raised glucose is a major cause of heart disease and renal disease. Now let's discuss the last metabolic risk factor, which is the overweight and obesity. Overweight and obesity are defined as abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that presents a risk to health. So we do have a measuring tool to classify whether a person is underweight, normal, overweight, or obese. This is the BMI or the body mass index. So how can we compute for BMI? The formula is weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. So between 25 and 29.9 indicates overweight. 30 or higher indicates obesity. We also have the skin fold thickness test and the waist to hip circumference ratio. Men greater than 102 cm and women greater than 88 centimeters are considered as high risk. Worldwide, obesity has more than doubled since 1980. In 2008, more than 1.4 billion adults 20 and older were overweight. Of these, 200 million men and nearly 300 million women were obese. 65% of the world's population live in countries where the mortality associated with overweight and obesity is higher than the mortality associated with underweight. Globally, 
In 2010, the number of overweight children under the age of 5 was estimated to be over 42 million. Close to 35 million of these are living in developing countries. Health Effects of Overweight and Obesity Environment, lifestyle, genetics, and other factors contribute to each individual's risk for being overweight or obese. This increases risk of coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension, and this causes large economic consequences for many countries. And that's all for our lecture for today, so these are my references. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.